They'll lose a unit. 10,000 workers will go down here in a steel mill in Hamilton, or they'll lose this or that, and then they don't have the money. And that's part of the problem, the crisis I think we're facing among uh, institutional labor is that Gulf, I'm not sure how many unions have the resources, even if they want to try a different model, to actually have the political will or the financial capital to try to do something even when they, they know, just like you know, just like I know, what they're doing doesn't work. So in the challenge of looking at this topic of opportunities and boundaries of community and labor organizing, um, I thought I would finish by looking at some things I've been thinking about uh, over the last couple of years since I left ACORN, which seem to be uh, almost universal truths to me that, you know, I've learned about organizing. And one is this thing, it turns out nobody believes in institutions anymore. Um, they don't believe in government, they don't believe in corporations, they don't believe in unions, they don't believe in Congress, they don't believe in courts, they don't even believe in the church. Institutions just aren't doing well, but luckily, for those of you who are interested in organizing, people still do believe in their neighbors and themselves and their capacity to do something with people who they know and trust. And that turns out to be a huge strength for people who believe in community organizing. The other thing that I've thought about a lot for all of the you know, argument I make that you need to go upscale and think bigger and act bigger, Real organizational power in this world, this would be the equivalent of Alexander the Great going all the way to India and conquering the existing world as we know it. Any organization, any community and labor organization that can figure out a real way to solve these three issues has no limit to the power. One is loose dogs. Another is bad sewage conditions. And crummy trash pickup. Now those three things, turns out anywhere you organize in the world, I don't care what methodology you use, loose dogs, bad drainage, lack of water, bad sewer, and crummy trash pickup, turns out to be the unifier for everybody. So if we get some real, some good organizers who are thinking about how to deal with that, I know it's not the sexiest issue in the world, but there's real power there. Institutions don't listen, they don't listen at all. I admire people passing on a petition, it turns out they only respond to action. Probably we all knew that, but you're reminded every day. The other thing is uh, the speaking truth to power. It's a big slogan when I started organizing in the late 60s. It doesn't work so well. Uh, it doesn't seem to work so well. And you can look at the difference. How many organizations, including great community organizations, great networks of community organizations, many of whom I've worked with closely, raise the issue of banks and the travesty of foreclosures, and all of a sudden it's taking over city parks. It's like Occupy Wall Street puts that in another dimension. So it turns out that uh, you really do have to do something more than speak truth to power. The other thing, now I'm going on the better news side, is that uh, it wasn't true in settling the West that rain follows the plow. Most of you probably have never lived in the West. This has no meaning to you. But it turns out the West is not like here in Ohio. It's very dry. So when they were settling in the West, people like Horace Greeley would say, rain follows the plow. If you just move out here and break ground, it'll be a new world. So that turns out not to be true in the real world. But it turns out in organizing, it really is true. Resources will always follow an organizing program that you force into action. On the other hand, if you wait for somebody to give you the money, still Social Security. That's your best hope. But you're not going to be successful organizing. If you won't take the risk, no one else will. One of the best examples I think I have, uh, one of the proudest moments of my, my time with ACORN was our national office was in New Orleans. And so 2005, we have, you know, 50 people in that building. Everything we do is simple as in New Orleans. You have this thing, Katrina comes in. Everything's gone. New Orleans Acorn had 6,000 members, dues paying members. If you looked at a GPS map, which Cornell and some of our partners did for us later, there wasn't a block in places like the Ninth Ward that didn't have a dues paying Acorn member. But it was a membership based organization, so there was some power they had in terms of trying to contact people so that they could help them. So in fighting to rebuild, 
They got it with uh, thousands of volunteers and millions of dollars, 5,000 houses, more than anybody else did at that time. And I won't go into the gutting program. It turns out the most expensive program you can ever run is a volunteer program. And I'm not, that's all I'm going to say. Um, you know what I'm talking about. But um, I, you know, what did I know about volunteer programs? I was a community organizer with, you know, all these blah, blah, blah. But, and they didn't single-handedly, but what this book tells the story of is how they went from a period where some of their largest areas had giant X's that were meant to never allow people to be able to go back to their homes. The Lower Ninth Ward was six months later with National Guard keeping people from even going in to see lost possessions. And the plan from the city and the business community was categorically funded and articulated by the Urban Land Institute not to allow people to go into their big exits in the times of Picayune. And the single, uh, the, this book ends at the point where the single largest sum of money is dedicated in the rebuilding to rebuilding uh, New Orleans East and the Ninth Ward. If you're going to take a risk, if you're going to do this work, if you're going to try to make change, the chances of failing are almost 100%. <laughs> so if you're going to do this work, and it's hard and it turns out sweaty work, um, <laughs> fall big. Try big. Don't try small. I mean, you're going to try it, and this is, uh, you know, you have to be, and this is one of the secrets that if you said, well, wait, you've had some success in this business. Well, it turns out I'm uneducable. Um, this is what I've known how to do since I was 20 years old. This is the only work I know, so I better learn how to do it. And secondly, I'm not afraid to fail. And so what are they going to do if I fail? I mean, but we have responsibility to win. So it turns out if we're persistent, take big risks, we win more often than we lose. You know, on my gravestone will say the one thing I did as an organizer was get people to pay dues. If you're not funded by your base, you can't survive an organization. And uh, this lesson is repeated over and over again. In fact, arguably, you probably shouldn't survive if you aren't funded by your base. Part of how Acorn ended up going out of business in, in the end of 2010 was that when it was under crisis, and this is obviously a very tragic thing you, I've watched from afar, it didn't hunker down and go to its base. It somehow believed it could appeal to what it thought were its friends. Unions, churches, institutions, foundations. And that doesn't work. Uh, and Planned Parenthood just showed us that. If you're able under attack to go to your base, you have a chance of, of survival. If you can't go to your base and pick yourself up and fight, then you don't have much of a chance of survival. Painful lesson. Members have to pay for services. Uh, one of the you know, big insight I had after a year of being an organizer for welfare rights and running their Massachusetts operation, which was the largest they had, we had 4,000 members. Membership dues and welfare rights, $1 a year. When I went a campaign in Springfield, I was literally would force the welfare department to hand out checks for household supplies and vouchers for furniture. I'd be giving checks out to welfare recipient families, AFDC mothers with children, that were worth thousands of dollars because we won these special needs benefits that meant you had, you got four chairs for every table, you got, you know, two sheets for every bed, and I don't know if they spent any of that money that way, but that wasn't really my issue. But I could have collected God knows what in dues from those families, but instead, Dollar was the due system. So the insight I took to Arkansas, which didn't have any money, was maybe we should do differently. And somehow we lost that in Acorn. The year I left, we were doing 50,000 tax returns, helping people get EITC, running Viva sites, and this, that, and the other. We were doing even more than that in terms of housing counseling, helping people get houses. So direct benefits, adding up to huge cash money, probably 125,000 families a year for free. And if, if I had had the, the good judgment, which I didn't have, to not have those things funded by donors, but instead have them funded by the members, ACORN would have been able to weather that problem, combining its dues from its members and the support from that base to be able to get by. So I'm pretty clear.